Hello everybody and welcome along. This is part 16 of the Attenborough readings. Thank you if you're still following along and enjoying the book. I hope you are. I presume you are. Otherwise you probably wouldn't be listening to this right now and watching this right now. So as always, just keep an eye out for all the different animals he's meeting and the different experiences. There's lots of things you can go onto Google and have a look for. Uh, search for pictures. Maybe even YouTube might be a good source as well. So let's keep going then. We're about to finish one chapter and move into another. In the middle of the afternoon, the hunting party returned. Slung over their backs in woven baskets, they carried loads of smoked fish, plucked carcasses of birds, and kipper brown joints of smoked tapir f flesh. I've just realised I normally would, of course, be using this. Don't know why I forgot today. Flesh. One man had a gun over his shoulder, and the rest were armed with blowpipes, bows, and arrows. Quietly and without speaking to King George or anyone else in the village, they walked up to the main hut, the floor of which had been brushed and sprinkled with water in readiness for them. They carried their loads in sides and stacked them around the centre pole. Still silent, they left the hut and walked fifty yards along the path towards the river. There they formed up in a column three deep and began chanting. With slow rhythmic steps, two forward and one back, they advanced in procession towards the hut. At the head of the column, three young men led the singing and every few minutes turned to face the rest of the dancers. Slowly they progressed up the path, lurching forward and stamping to emphasise the simple rhythm of their chant. As they entered the hut, the song and the rhythm changed, and they linked arms and circled the pile of flesh and meat in the centre. Occasionally, a woman from the village wandered into the hut and attached herself to the end of the procession. Several times in the droning three-note chant, I distinguished the words Hallelujah and Papa. Excuse me a sec, let's move this up. King George squatted on his heels, pensively fiddling with a stick in the dust. The chant ended rather inconclusively and the singers stood about looking abstractedly at the ceiling or examining the floor. Suddenly the men who had led the procession began singing again and everyone reformed into a line facing inwards, each with his right hand on his neighbour's shoulder. After ten minutes the singers knelt down and in unison spoke a brief and solemn prayer. They got to their feet and the man with the gun walked over to King George, shook him by the hand and lit a cigarette. The hallelujah service was over. And strange though it was, we were left with an impression of deep sincerity. Like sincerity means something you really sort of buy into and care for. That night was to be our last in the Amerindian settlement. I was unable to sleep. Towards midnight, I climbed out of my hammock and walked slowly through the mid moonlit village. As I approached the big round house, I heard the noise of voices and saw the flicker of the lights through chinks in the wooden walls. I paused by the door and heard King George's voice say, If you wish to enter, David, you're very welcome. I stooped and walked inside. The hut was lit only by a large fire which illuminated the smoked roof beams and the beautiful curves of several dozen giant calabushes which were grouped on the floor. Men and women lay in hammocks, crisscrossing the, uh, from beam to beam, others squatted on small wooden stools, carved. I'll come to the picture of this in a second. Carved in a stylized form of a tortoise. Tortoise. Occasionally, a woman, naked except for her bead apron, rose and walked gracefully across the hut, the firelight dappling her body. King George reclined in his hammock, holding his right hand, a small muscle-like shell, its halves tied together with a string passed through holes just above the hinges. Reflectively, he felt his chin until he discovered a bristle. Then he closed the rims of the shell firmly around the hair and plucked it out. It's unlike shaving for us, eh? Just gives you again a bit of an idea of the sorts of locations that we're talking about when you see the pictures like this, as it says there in the caption, preparing to record Hallelujah. You can just about see his arm stretched out uh, there. Right. The air was filled with low conversation in Akawao. One man squatted by the enormous calabashes, stirring them with a long stick and pouring out the pink lumpy fluid they contained into a smaller calabash, which was handed round to everyone in the hut. This drink, I knew, was kasiri, and I had read of the way in which it's supposed to be prepared. Its main constituent is boiled grated cassava, but added to it is sweet potato and cassava bread, which has been assiduously chewed by the women. Think about that a minute. They put an ingredient, which is chewed bread. The women chew it and they put it into a drink. I know, you're probably turning your noses up right now. I don't know if I'd have it either. This addition of spittle, which is another word for spit, is supposed to aid in the fermentation of the drink. Basically, it makes it a bit more sort of alcoholic. 
Soon the small calabash was circulating among the people sitting close by me, and at length it was put into my hands. I felt it would be exceedingly impolite to refuse it, but at the same time I could not dismiss from my mind the method of its manufacture. I lifted it to my lips, and, as I caught the acrid smell of vomit that arose from it, my stomach heaved. I began drinking, uh, and realised that if I had to taste that initial sip again, I might well be unable to control my stomach. So with an effort, I held the calabash to my mouth until I had drained it. With relief, I handed back the empty bowl and smiled weakly. King George leaned out of his hammock and grinned approvingly. "'Hey, you!' he called to the man in charge of calabashes. David, like Cassirian, gets big thirst. Give him some more. It's exactly what you wouldn't want, isn't it? I was immediately handed another brimming calabash. As quickly as possible, I poured it down my throat. On second acquaintance, I managed to discount the nauseating smell and decided that, although Cassiria was a bit gritty and lumpy, its actual bittersweet taste was not wholly unpleasant. I sat listening to the conversation for another hour. It was a fascinating scene and I was tempted to run back to our own hut and fetch a flash camera. Somehow the thought was repugnant. It seemed an infringement of the hospitality which had been so generously offered to me by King George and his companions. Contentedly, I sat in the hut until early, until the early morning. And there ends that chapter, and we move on to a new one called Shanties on the Mazzurini. So shanties come in fashion very much at the time of recording, as I record this, like sea shanties, like songs, basically. So we'll read a little bit more of this before I stop for today. Georgetown seemed particularly attractive to us when we returned from the Mazaruni. We relished the thought of eating meals which were not emptied straight from tins and which we had not cooked ourselves, and of lying flat on a bed covered with a clean white sheet instead of curling in a hammock under a damp crumpled blanket excavated from the bottom of a musty kit bag. But we also had a great deal of work to do. Fresh supplies of food had to be bought and plans for the next trip to be made, and the exposed film had to be sorted, repacked, and sealed and taken down to the city's cold store to be deposited in a refrigerated vault. It's a lot of work, isn't it, this filming, compared to what you do these days with digital. The animals had to be transferred to the larger permanent cages which Tim Vinyl had built in readiness for them, and some of them had to be taken to the Georgetown Zoo, which was already looking after the anteater and was now offering to take Houdini, the crested carousel, as temporary lodgers. Our next journey should have been to a remote area on the edge of the Amazon Basin in the far south. There, two missionaries were living and working with very primitive and interesting Amerindian tribe. The only way for us to reach them, apart from a march through the forest, which, there and back, would take six weeks, was to land in an amphibian plain at the point on the river some 50 miles away from the tribe, having previously arranged with the missionaries by radio that canoes and porters would be there to meet us. An amphibian plane is one that can land on water. This was our plan, but to our dismay we discovered that the missionaries had been out... Out what? The missionaries had been out of radio contact with Georgetown for the past three weeks. Their radio must have broken down, and so there was no way of warning them of our arrival. To land without advanced preparations would be to maroon ourselves in an uninhabited forest, without guides, porters, or any means of transport. An alternative scheme, however, was already forming in our minds. We had left a message by a, ma a manager of a mining company to say that the forest round one of his exploratory camps in Arakaka, in the northern part of the country, was particularly rich in animals, and that the camp itself there were several tame creatures which he would willingly give us. We looked at the map. Arakaka lay at the head of the Barima River, which ran through par roughly parallel to the northern boundary of Guyana, and then swung northwest to the empty into the estuary of the Orinoco. The map told us two other important facts. First, a small red symbol of an aeroplane printed by the name Mount Everard, 50 miles downriver from Arakaka, showed us that we could reach that point at least by amphibian plane. Second, a cluster of red circles along the southern bank of the Barima indicated that there were many small gold workings. From this we inferred that there must be considerable traffic along the river and that there was therefore every chance of finding a boat which could take us up from Mount Everard to Arakaka. We investigated further. The airways told us that the only time during the next fortnight that an amphibian was free for charter was the following day, and the docks told us in 12 days' time a passenger ship would be returning to Georgetown from Morowana, a small settlement in the mouth of the Barima. 
If we were to go, we should have to go tomorrow. Unfortunately, there was no means of warning the mining manager for his only contact with his office in Georgetown was by radio phone, and while he could call his office, his office could not call him. We therefore left a message to be passed on the next time he called, saying that we would be arriving, that we would be arriving in Arakaka in three or four days' time. We booked passengers for our return on the ship SS Tarpon, and we chartered the amphibian. I just want to point out quickly just the amount of work they have to go to. In fact, I'm going to pause it there for today, but point out the amount of work they have to go to. We have to be so grateful today to have, you know, our mobile phones and just instant communication with people. And you forget just how difficult life used to be and how organised and how you'd have to make arrangements. So there we go. We're ending that there for today. That was part 16. Uh, you'll find part 17 uploaded and uh, there for you to have a watch of very shortly. So thank you very much for listening and goodbye.